welcome to the world of Budo, or martial arts. I'm Terry O'Neill, and over the next three weeks, I'll be your guide in exploring a fascinating part of Japanese culture that has a growing number of followers here in the West. Durham City Budosai is a great celebration of the martial arts and a perfect showcase for some of the exciting styles that have been developed. The masters attending the Budosai are amongst the most senior martial artists in the world and we'll be joining them as they both explain and demonstrate some of their awesome skills. Because the martial arts have a long and complex history, during which time many different styles have been developed, we've drawn up this family tree to help make things easier. During our coverage of the Budosai, we'll see just how those fighting skills have been developed. We'll also consider the fundamental principles that apply to all the martial arts. They are known as the three Ks. Anyone taking up a martial art must start by learning the most basic stances and techniques. These basics are known as kihon. Students of the martial arts are required to practice these movements every day until they become second nature, being performed with little conscious effort. When these basics are learned, they must then be put into a series of movements called combinations. These are designed to help develop the coordination of the body and the mind. When students have learned how to move, they must next begin to put sequences of combinations together. This is called kata, and is common to most of the martial arts. Kata enables any student to practice either in class or on their own. Each style has many different kata which help to develop the techniques that are essential in discovering free-flowing actions and helping build confidence in executing the kind of movements the body has all but forgotten how to perform. Through constant practice in kata, a student gains a feeling for the spirit of the martial arts, which elevates the movements above the level of mere exercise or dance. While all kata develop fighting technique, some are also designed to build strength and power.
The eventual application of learned Kihon basics and kata is known as kumite, or sparring. Many martial arts were, of course, founded to provide an individual with protection from a potential enemy. While kata provided a catalogue of possible techniques, kumite allows for the practical application of these skills in a controlled way. They are practiced for the mutual benefit of the martial artists and are performed at both slow and fast speed so that their reactions can be improved. All the styles that we are to see over the next three programs use sparring methods. While beginners concentrate on simple pre-arranged routines, the masters that we'll be seeing show how it is possible to deal with any type of attack. These three Ks will help develop self-discipline, self-defense, fitness, and a greater sense of awareness bringing together the best elements of a sport and combining them with traditional values. To begin our journey into the fighting arts, we see how the samurai lives on at the heart of Japanese martial tradition. The samurai were the dominant class in Japan for a thousand years. Originally simple warriors who fought to preserve or expand their lord's domain, they became the rulers of Japan, controlling much of Japanese society. Their code of Bushido influenced many aspects of Japanese life, and indeed it is still a potent force in Japan. The name samurai is derived from a word which means to serve. Ready to lay down their lives if necessary, they develop tremendous fighting skills, allied with a strong sense of duty to their superiors. Some samurai devoted their whole lives to mastering the sword, a curved, razor-sharp weapon generally accepted as the most perfect blade ever made. The katana was the longest of the two swords carried by the samurai, a slashing weapon which cut as it was drawn back towards the swordsman. As the edge is composed of hardened steel, it can be honed to razor sharpness. This, combined with efficient technique, developed by long hours of arduous training, produced a unity of sword and swordsman which has seldom been equaled. Facing such an opponent on a battlefield must have been a terrifying experience, and we can only guess at the strength and bravery of the men who voluntarily sought out such combat. basic training, the student learns to hold the sword correctly, a bit like the grip on a golf club. This allows the sword to swing accurately. Once the correct grip is achieved, the swordsman may adopt one of the many kamai, or on guard positions, from which he can rapidly attack or defend. They are designed either to threaten a particular part of an opponent's body, or to trick him into making an attack, which could expose him to a lightning fast counter strike. The design of the blade used by the samurai was the product of long years of development and testing. At the earliest time, swords tended to be brittle and snapped in combat. But gradually, as the swordsmith's art improved, so did the quality of the blades. By alternately folding and hammering out the metal, they created a blade composed of hundreds of layers of steel, each of differing hardness. The cutting edge of the sword was tempered to produce a weapon that combines strength and flexibility with the capacity to absorb the worst effects of two blades crashing together. During the time of the samurai, the best way for a young warrior to acquire the skills that enabled him to become a formidable swordsman 
was to place himself in the hands of an experienced master. Ideally, one who had triumphed on the battlefield in life or death combat. Master swordsmen often established their own Ryu, or martial traditions, in order to pass on their hard-won secrets. Of course, not all swordsmen did this. Some were unapproachable, living severe lives dedicated to their own training. But if a young samurai was fortunate enough to find a good teacher, then he would eventually learn all his master's secrets. At first, basic techniques would be taught. But after the apprentice signed the kepan, or blood oath, he would be initiated into the mysteries of the art. These methods were kept secret because they were truly matters of life and death. An enemy, knowing your technique, could perfect a defense and counterattack, which would almost certainly result in your death. These secret techniques were taught through the kata. Every day, the swordsman would repeat these prearranged movements, either by himself or with a partner, until not only his body was disciplined, but also his mind and his spirit. The techniques in the kata developed from actual battlefield experience. The results were lethal when carried through. So in training, maximum control and total concentration was necessary on the part of the swordsman. In battle, a warrior's mind must flow with the technique, his emotional state resembling a calm moon reflected in still water, unaffected by the fear of death. Under the Tokugawa shoguns, Japan entered a long period of comparative peace. The samurai ceased to be simple warriors and took on many new roles, involving themselves in government, education and finance. Of course, they continued to train in the martial arts in order to maintain their heritage and skills. But without battlefield experience and the reality of fighting, it was felt by some sensei or teachers that simply training in kata wasn't enough. Practical fighting techniques were slowly losing their vitality and realism. A solution had to be found. The one idea that revolutionized the way of the sword was the development of a mock bamboo weapon, a shinai, and protective armor that allowed strikes to be made without lethal consequences. To prevent the students lashing out wildly, only specific targets were deemed worthy of attack. The head, chest, abdomen and forearms. A solid cut with a real sword on any one of these areas would end the fight. Today, kendo is a recognized sport with a large international following. But students are still expected to maintain the same mental and physical values that have always been central to the samurai tradition. For the serious kendo practitioner, the sport can never truly replace the classical way of the sword.
while the samurai became famous for their use of the sword, the war-torn people of Okinawa were busy developing their own unique style of weaponry. Sensei Motokatsu Inoue, president of the Ryuku Kobujutsu Hozen Shinkokai and Yushinkai Karate Jutsu, was the student of three great masters. He studied the fighting techniques of the ninja from Seiko Fujita, the 14th head of the Kogo Ryu. Okinawan karate methods were studied under Yasuhiro Konishi, and Shinken Taira taught Inoue Sensei the classical 42 kata of traditional Okinawan weapons. The Hozen Shinkokai is dedicated to the preservation and promotion of the eight classical Okinawan weapons. Shinken Taira taught Inoue Sensei to develop prearranged sparring drills derived from the kata. Some of those methods are shown here. Julian Mead is a godan, or fifth degree black belt, and one of the senior teachers of authentic Kobujutsu in Great Britain. Here, he performs part of a tomfa kata, which he learnt in Japan as a student of Master Inoue. Julian, you're a teacher, in fact, you're a master of Okinawan Kobudo, which is traditional weaponry. What are the origins of those weapons? The weapons are the Okinawan weapons, a series of eight and they used, were used, by lower class people in Okinawa. More farmers and people, uh, what, we, what Japanese would call, call, I would say, a lower class people. Um, in history, they were suppressed by the Japanese and not allowed to carry weapons of, a, of any nature. And therefore, they utilized farming implements to a degree. Um, I say to a degree because on, on subsequent research with Inoue Sensei, it was quite obvious that many weapons have come from China also. So out of the eight, there are several weapons that have come across from China in the form of weapons rather than tools. However, there are some weapons, the ninchaku and tomfa, there, where there are certain connections to farming implements. And this was, is, is then the basis of Okinawan weaponry, i.e. from farmers generally. So the Japanese invaded Okinawa and presumably uh, uh, landed there with their swords. That's right, yes. There are many old stories about um, samurai challenging Okinawan teachers. Oh, share them with us. For bowl. Well, one, one, one story is the sunakake, the ache, you see, the oar, which is that, what we call the highest class of bowl. Um, and there was a samurai, again quoted from Inoue, that pestered one a certain teacher um, to challenge him bow against katana. And the teacher refused and refused, and he was caught one day on the beach by the samurai, who then challenged him and said, the time has come, you've, you've refused too many times. You've avoided me long enough. You've got to do something. So he picked up one of the oars on the flatboats that the Okinawans used, called a sabani no kai, which we know as ache. Um, and the techniques of that kata and the techniques of the weapon are splashing sand into the face and stabbing into the throat. And that was the demise of the samurai, basically. I was going to ask you to finish it. Who yes. won? Well, the story, as the story goes, the, the samurai attacked. He picked, the, he picked the oar up off the boat, and his reflexes were just to splash sand into his face. And as he, as he did so, of course, the neck went back, and the natural thrust of the bowl was then forward into the throat. <laughs> Weapons are an extension, and are taught in Japan from black belt stage. They are, to a degree, of course, violent, um, but the students are taught from a very early stage to respect, one, the weapon, and two, the, the opponents that they're training with, to ensure there's, a, there's, not, there's not a high degree of injury. When you're training in that situation, you're very much more aware of the pressure and tension between two people. And as you become um, a more senior in weaponry, yeah. then, of course, the intention is much stronger to actually de deliver complete blows and complete attacks to your best ability. And obviously, the, the, the other side will be, will be dodging those and moving all the time. Very much the same as karate. Being an extension, the foot movements and the body movements are one of the same. The distance that weapons give you are sometimes greater and sometimes smaller. I, with the bowl, we'll be looking for a greater distance to work from and with knuckle dusters, we'll be coming in close. In meeting my sensei, Motokatsu Inoue, I was so impressed with what he was teaching, which was a whole package, rather than just the karate. It was then, he would always teach the karate and, and then the weapons, and vice versa, when he taught weapons, he would always do it empty-handed first to show the students what he wanted, and then he'd pick up the weapon and take it from there. Um, then he incorporated, obviously, locks and holds, and the package became one. I had ideas in Japan of going to many teachers to do many aspects, and I found I had everything in one style. What was it like training in Japan? I mean, it's the epitome of the martial arts that a lot of people would want to go to Japan and train. 
Mm, yes, I, I believe that in Japan you learn certain things you can't learn here, but they're not things about kicking and punching. They're more about the culture of the Japanese. Um, and if the package is deep enough, if your tuition is deep enough, you learn why you bow, you learn why you say things like the how does I must or us in some styles. Um, they teach you more about manner um, and about being correct in building your character. As you become more aware of the tools you use, i.e. your fists, your legs, and your weapons, if you're using them, um, you then can also become more dangerous if you're not controlled. I believe that after your five years in Japan, you came back with more than an expert knowledge in weaponry. I came back with a fair grasp of the weapons, and I've just tried to push it from there, yes. You also came back with a Japanese wife. Yes. So you um, weren't doing weapons all the time? No, I wasn't, no. That was something that was, was um, an important part of surviving in Japan, yes. Um, and I got married in Japan also. So again, the culture and the understanding was more apparent in doing that. And I saw many things there that we do in martial arts that I realized weren't just martial arts, but part of the Japanese way. So, we've seen that weapons could be very decisive in a fight, but so too could the empty hand. Now, we look to the island of Okinawa. In the last program, we saw how the evolution of a warrior's skills relied on their ability with weapons. The Okinawans had shown great ingenuity in adapting everyday farming tools. Their determination to survive also led them to develop a martial art that is now among the most widely practiced in the world, karate. shown that if all else failed, in the absence of swords or other weapons, the empty hand had to be employed, and decisively so. Gichin Funakoshi, the father of modern-day Japanese karate, was born in Shuri, the capital of Okinawa, in 1868. His style of karate became known as Shotokan, tracing its roots from the older Okinawan karate systems of Shorin Ryu, which he originally learned and then taught before leaving to live in Japan. 
A son of a samurai, he started his karate practice at primary school. Having been a sickly child, he rapidly grew stronger through his training. As a school teacher, he was very pro-Japanese and understood that for karate to flourish, it had to become accepted by the other established martial arts on the Japanese mainland. In 1922, he was asked to demonstrate karate in Tokyo. It soon drew a large following and quickly became accepted as a Japanese martial art. In Japan, he realized that the future of karate lay in getting the young men of the universities involved. This would bring many benefits, including status, the students often being from wealthy or influential families. At the same time, their more intellectual and strong physical approach would assure karate a place in the modern, forward-thinking face of the new Japan. As has been shown in all the martial arts, the development of strong basic techniques is essential. They help build strength and a sense of awareness. At the same time, the student begins to understand some of the elementary precepts. Karate ni sentinash, which literally means there is no first attack in karate. This maxim, that karate is for defense, is one of the first and most important principles to be learned. Funakoshi stressed that karate was for everyone, men, women and children. To acquire any skill in karate, the student must be prepared to spend many years learning the basic techniques. There is no quick road to learning these skills. Much diligent practice is required before any real progress can be achieved. On average, it takes three to five years for a student to gain the coveted black belt. Snap. All kata begin with a block. To fully understand and appreciate the kata, it is necessary to apply the techniques against a strong attack. This helps in coordinating the mind and body to develop total control. In kata, the student learns to condense the basic techniques into a series of effective blocks and counter-attacks. While training alone will develop the visual aspect of the kata, it is necessary to apply the techniques against an attacker in order to understand the more subtle meaning of the movements. Sure. 
As skills develop, more advanced forms of kata are introduced, adding to the student's repertoire of techniques, teaching more sophisticated methods of attack and defense. Whilst a strong, dynamic spirit is essential in any contact sport, anger and rage are unacceptable. The karateka's emotional state and physical technique must both exhibit control and discipline. Mitsusuki Harada is the most senior Shotokai karate teacher in Europe. He studied Shotokan karate with Gichin Funakoshi in Japan during the Second World War. While Shotokan emphasizes the development of speed and power, Shotokai stresses the need for the student to cultivate spirit and internal energy. After Funakoshi's death, his senior students could not agree on the future of the style. Some of them went on to form the Japan Karate Do Shotokai, or Shoto's group, an organization devoted to preserving the orthodox form of Funakoshi's teachings. Technically similar to the JKA approach, Shotokai is characterized by a more relaxed, fluid training style. In applications of its techniques, Shurakai emphasizes the use of distance to contain an attack and by continual movement to frustrate an opponent.
It is commonly assumed that karate is simply an art of striking, but in fact all traditional karate styles include methods of controlling an opponent with throws or wrist locks. These were used in situations where a punch or a kick might be considered excessive or unnecessary. Here we see Master Inoue and Master Okabayashi, teachers of traditional Okinawan karate, demonstrating a range of wrist locks taught by the Yushinkai karate jutsu system. Wrist locks are particularly effective as the degree of pain caused is usually enough to restrain most attackers. One system which specializes in throws and wrist locks is the Japanese art of Aikido. Meaning the way of harmony, Aikido seeks to defeat an aggressor by using turning and spinning movements to neutralize an opponent's strength and so unbalance him. In common with all other martial arts, the student must learn the basic movements or principles. It is often said that a master of Aikido resembles a hurricane, calm at the center, but moving so rapidly that anyone trying to enter his space is thrown violently away. Aikido is an art founded by Morohai Ueshiba. As a young man, he studied many systems of jujutsu and swordsmanship until he met Master Sogaku Takeda, a teacher of classical Daiso Ryu Aikijutsu, a semi secret method taught to the samurai of Aizu province. Ueshiba restructured the art into a method of self discipline and self protection, and his students have since spread Aikido worldwide. The weapon most encountered by a samurai in the past was likely to be an opponent's sword. Aikido has preserved and still teaches methods of disarming a swordsman. Obviously, these are the skills of highly trained masters. And as there is great danger in these techniques, they should not be attempted without the necessary training. A samurai would only resort to these methods if no other option was available and his life was at risk. Ah! 
Traditionally, Japanese people sit on the floor to eat and talk. Japanese martial arts have always taken account of this and have developed various techniques to deal with attacks when in a formal seated position. It was usually assumed that the attacker would be armed with a knife, as it was not usual to take the long sword into the house on a social visit. And so the defense methods feature closing, turning movements, designed to throw the attacker face down with the weapon arm well controlled. Aikido techniques can be used most effectively against more than one attacker. When used correctly, the dynamic twisting and spinning movements enable the Aikido master to avoid and redirect the number of attackers. Karate is without doubt one of the most devastating fighting systems ever developed. We feature two more traditional karate systems, Okinawan Goju-ryu and Japanese Wado-ryu. And we look at an unarmed combat system from Brazil, the amazing Capoeira. Well, we'll be seeing more of the breathtaking capoeira later. But for now, back to the Orient. Goju Ryu is a style of karate from Okinawa, famous for its very powerful close-range fighting techniques. It is perhaps the best known of the Okinawan systems. And Master Morio Higoana is one of the most famous teachers of Goju Ryu. Goju Ryu Karate is derived from methods of Chinese boxing, native to South China. An Okinawan master, Kanryu Higawana, brought these methods to Okinawa in the 19th century, and his student, Chojin Miyagi, developed and refined the Chinese way to suit the native Okinawan people.
As a system that stresses the art of close quarter fighting, Goju Ryu practitioners use various methods of conditioning to toughen their body and increase their ability to absorb pain. Here we see Master Higawana demonstrating arm conditioning with one of his senior students. Such severe training should only be attempted by advanced karateka. A distinctive feature of Goju-ryu training is known as hojo undu or equipment training. Typically, practitioners of this system use a mixture of modern and traditional training aids, including pads to develop striking skills and other more specialized tools for building strength. The Congo Ken or iron ring is used to develop total body power, while the Chishi or strength stone develops the arms, wrists and shoulders. Go on, Sensei. How yes. many years have you been studying karate now? I train about 39 years. 39 years? Yes. Since you were a young boy? Yes. Do you still enjoy it as much now? Yes, I enjoy for training. I love karate. You love karate? Yes. <laughs> I think that's obvious when you see your training. <laughs> you once told me that karate was a, a personal challenge to you. You faced it as a challenge every day. What did you mean by that? Uh, challenge uh, my own spirit, uh, my own mental side. Also, challenge to life. A challenge to life? Life, my life. Because day by day, you know, uh, now I'm 53 years old, body become weak. When you first started as a boy, what was the exciting thing about karate on the canal? Was it fighting? Yes. Tell me the truth. <laughs> uh, there's ma many, many uh, things. First uh, point, you know, a young time, want for fighting strong. The another thing is uh, influence uh, my father and friends too. Because area many karate some you see. Also my father, he teach to my uh, father friends. I saw for ping, punching, kicking. I surprised. Oh, it's great. Maybe if this training, maybe become strong. Sensei, the word goju means hard and soft. Mm. A technical side, you know, uh, if something very hard and punch, <coughs> punch. but the other ju meaning for like a tension, you know, tension. So technical something and tension for hard, go and ju, hard I see. and soft. Also, uh, hard meaning many condition training, macula, chishi, uh, weapon training. To toughen the body. Uh, yes. The inside condition for you, the inhale, except always mental side, uh, a concentration tandem. You tandem training become mental side more become gentle. In Goju Ryu, the basic kata are used to help develop the fundamental techniques. The kata features high and low stances with the body strength concentrated in the lower abdomen or tanden, seen by the Japanese as the center of physical and spiritual vitality in the body.
Sanqin is the essential kata in the Goju Ryu system and is designed to teach the student how to focus the body's energy, control breathing, and develop an immovable stance. Is karate still a challenge to you? You told me once that you challenge karate every day. Yes. I challenge karate, also challenge to myself. So it's a personal challenge? Yes. Yeah. Would you describe yourself as a violent man or a gentleman? Uh, karate ka violence? Violence? No, you. <laughs> no violence. No violence? Uh, no violence. Uh, no violence? No violence. <laughs> so if I was to ask you why you carry weapons with you all the time, you carry Me? weapons. I'm referring to your hands. <laughs> no. This uh, my uh, no 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 sensei the other the other side of your hands. And <laughs> this uh, this uh, training for me. Training for you. For me and also for <coughs> the student teaching to uh, next generation. Goju Ryu Karate has stayed true to traditional values and has never stressed the sporting aspect, as have many other styles. The fighting techniques are structured to target powerful strikes and blows onto the weakest part of the opponent's body. The eyes, throat, groin, and other vital spots being vulnerable to close-in strikes, often followed with a throw or takedown. These blows are potentially lethal, so great care must always be applied in learning and training in these methods. These skills take many years to acquire, and reaching the standards seen here takes much dedicated training. Wado Ryu is a style of Japanese karate which features evasive body turns and the redirecting of an opponent's strength. It was founded by Hironoru Otsuka, a student of Gichin Funakoshi. He was also a master of jiu-jitsu, and by combining the strikes and kata of Funakoshi's teachings with the evasions, throws and wrist locks of jiu-jitsu, Otsuka created the first true method of Japanese karate. What is the difference between Wadaru and all the other systems of karate? Well, I should say main difference is we don't have any blocks. We try to parry everything and nagashi and punch on the same time. The same time in uh, Ayuchi, simultaneous strikes? Yes, try to be Ayuchi, but try to avoid opponent attack, then get in. Yes. Rather than a block and a counter? Yes. I see. Are there any other differences in, in, in Wadaru? Well, it's, uh, Otsuka sensei studied Yoshin Ryu Jiu Jitsu before he studied karate from Funakoshi sensei. So he mixed with Yoshin Ryu Jiu Jitsu and Yagyu Ryu Kenjutsu. Kenjutsu? Yes. Oh. So, so basically, Japanese martial art and Okinawa martial art mixed. You know, uh, uh, karate is split into the, into the three Ks uh, Kihon, Kata, and Kumite. Yes. Of those three, which would you say is the most important? I should say Kihon is most important. The basic techniques? Yes. 
Why? Because if you cook basic, you could do it, everything. Basic is like base of the house. Strong base is a strong house. So do you still, do you still practice in the basic techniques? Yes, I do. Even after 35, 36 years? Yes. I only could perfect basic technique, maybe in one in 30. You say uh, Kihon is the most important, but I know quite a bit about your early history. You've been in England for a long time. Yes. And if you don't mind me saying, you were respected, maybe feared is the correct word, as a very, very tough and very strong fighter. Yes. I, because my, when I started, I want to be a strong street fighter. <laughs> then I practice 10 years, 20 years. I start wondering, why should I do it? So I start reading all Japanese martial art books and Zen books. Then yeah. I found different purpose yeah. of uh, martial art. So I changed the total. Uh, I think if uh, somebody saw me now, they can't recognize me. So you're saying that you're no longer tough? No. Nope. I don't no. think so. <laughs> <laughs> so in effect, karate has changed you? Yes. Yes, changed my life totally. Do you think that's an important concept uh, uh, for people to practice karate, uh, the fact that it can change their character? Yes, I think it's the main thing to practice martial art is that more than uh, winning or losing. Yeah. So do you think you can get that from all martial arts if the teacher is correct? Yes. You, you do? Yes. Sensei, one of the concepts that I know that you adhere to is uh, a concept of Shingi Tai. Yes. Uh, well, what is that? Spirit, mind, and body, and body, body together. Well, that means I, I, I always think uh, humor is part of nature. So, like uh, shingita, it's like uh, nature, like a tree or flowers. They, they, in the winter, they covered by snow, but spring comes, they grow up. The same for the uh, martial artist. Be patient. One day, find a good character many possibilities. So that is Shingi Tai Nei spirit, the mind, the body, always be together. Yeah. So that would be your advice to, uh, to martial artists? Yes. Sensei, you said that karate has changed you and in fact seems to have mellowed you, um, mellowed you, you know, sort of uh, calmed you. Yeah. But it's, it's usually a, a young men, young people yeah. have a lot of spirit. Yes. Do you still, uh, do you still teach them in that way? Yes. You, you do? For fighting, Yes, you must fight to survive. But for the outside, maybe melt, nice smile, but inside, more strong than before. While the Durham Budosai was primarily a celebration of Oriental martial arts, it was privileged to feature a rarely seen self-defense system from Brazil, known as capoeira. Developed by slaves at the end of the 18th century and suppressed by the slave owners, it survived by being disguised as a very energetic dance. In the early versions of capoeira, it was always assumed that the opponent would be armed with a blade. So capoeira stresses the use of expansive spinning kicks and highly acrobatic movements to avoid any attack. The music sets the pace for the movements and is used by the masters to regulate the intensity of the fighting. Today, capoeira has taken its place as a martial art. And like the oriental methods, capoeira practitioners regard their art as much more than simply fighting. Master Gato is a leading teacher from the Senzala Capoeira group of Brazil. Master Gato, I'd always thought that Capoeira was a dance, but after seeing that demonstration, it seems a pretty deadly dance. Well, dance, it can be a dance, but life is always a dance. And so Capoeira is a way to, to how to learn to fight a lot, uh, through life and enjoy it. You know, I believe that uh, all the black civilization 
where capoeira is based, is very based in, in movement, sound, music. So everything that we, we have through this way is slightly moved, you know, with rhythm, with sound, and plenty of life. Capoeira, it's a, a way where through you can enjoy your life in terms of uh, real life. You, know? you don't need to be intellectual or to realize some, something ideal. You go straight to the, the real life and enjoy it and learn how to enjoy it. You know? At the same time, you are fighting. All this together give, uh, give a pleasure because we men and women, we like to some challenge every time and so you have fun. Capoeira uh, became a very creative art. So it's all, it is always changing because it allows the, you to create whatever you want. It allows free expression. That's right. So you can express yourself through it. It's in the roda, the circle where we play the games. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge between the, the two people there. Martial arts are like a game. You make a kind of a strategy. You sometimes the, the other one is too too close, too too shut, we call not open. So you have to make it a little bit open. To do this, you have to fake or to show yourself a little bit open to call him to come in. All this kind of thing is a kind of a game. So you are a player. So despite the fact that Capoeira had a pretty violent history. You now see it as a, as a game. Yeah, but it can be a very violent game. You can handle it, you know, through the rhythm, through the music, through the movement. It's a, like a, a life representation. So you can put all your interior inside it, you know. So as you said, in fact, it's a theater of life. That's right. That's the idea. There is no doubt that learning a martial art can be a very rewarding experience. It teaches self-defense, heightens general awareness, helps build strength, and can make you super fit. Wherever you live, there is usually some form of martial arts training available. But take care to train with a bona fide club. There are some characters around who are, shall we say, less than the real thing. So shop around a bit, do some research before you commit yourself, but above all, enjoy it. Well, with that, it's almost time to take our leave from the Durham City Budosai. I hope you've enjoyed our coverage. Our aim is to entertain and educate you. If we've been successful in stimulating your interest in the martial arts, let us know. And then, as the saying goes, we'll be back.